Welcome to the Unified Brand Podcast, brought to you by Elements Brand Management, a weekly brand building and brand strategy podcast to help you unlock your brand's potential, stand out from the competition, and create impact. So today we're joined by Anthony Tuskell, a storytelling expert, trainer, and brand strategist, and author of the storytelling book, The Inspiratorium, Incitations, and his new work, The Storytelling Workbook. Great to have you on the Unified Brand Podcast, Taz. It'd be good to learn a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, hello. Hi, Chris. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, I, I often call myself a man of many lanyards because I never quite know how to sort of put it into a short sentence. So I started off working in ad agencies as a strategist account planner for several centuries and then got interested in answers which weren't always a 40-second television ad. So started getting interested in storytelling, behavioral economics, insight, and because I had a life before advertising, which was as a classicist, was fascinated by how stories used to work as children, when we learn them at school or university, and then thought, why is it that when we work in jobs, when we have to do presentations, when we have to come up with brand strategies, how come they're so dull? So I sort of tried to combine those interests together and started thinking about and talking to people about how to bring storytelling into presentations, into documents, into speeches, into brand strategies. And suddenly found myself doing this as a training gig, lecturing and writing books on the subject. So that's sort of my trajectory. It makes it sound very sort of linear, but it wasn't. It was a little bit bumpier than that. But that's how I got to where I am now. Brilliant. So in terms of storytelling as a whole, why do you think we've lost the art of storytelling? What is the thing that's holding people back from uncovering that? I think it's, um, uh, there's a couple of words I use. One is we're increasingly living in what I call an arithmocracy. We've become obsessed with numbers and measurements and controlling them and metrics and KPIs. It doesn't matter whether you're in the government, public sector, in the private sector, if you're in schools, the NHS, the police, everything is becoming defined by numbers. And again, more and more presentations are defined by data and graphs and infographics and statistics. And I think we all know this sort of beast that we've created is burdened with facts, information, and numbers. And we've always become a prisoner, I think, of that world. So part of what I do both in the books and in my training is, first of all, is to realize how we got here, to realize that we've created this world, which has become obsessed, which is worshipped at the altar of numbers and facts. Now, I'm not saying that numbers and facts aren't important. Clearly, you know, they are. But we need more than that. If you want to persuade people, if you want to influence people, if you want to gain their support, you have to bring in emotions, which is where behavioral economics comes in. And you have to create something as a vehicle for those emotions, which is where storytelling comes in. So that's how I like to think that we can get out of this conundrum. It's interesting. So in terms of actually mapping those emotions to the outcome of the stories you create, is that something that you look at early on or is that something that comes in a little bit later on? I think it depends on the need, on the need, on the client, whether it's a speech, a presentation, or whatever. But I do say to people at some point during either the training or mentoring or working with a client, think about your objectives for your document or your presentation, but don't just think about the rational objectives. What are the emotions that you want to achieve in your audience? And I often do this as an exercise with clients. I'll say, okay, take your deck and then ask yourself, knowing your audience. What do you want them to feel? Do you want them to feel happy that you confirm what they know? Do you want them to feel angry that they should have done something that they haven't? Do you want them to feel afraid that if they don't do what you're recommending, there'll be a disaster, their brand will decline or whatever it might be? So that is something that I try and get people to think of because it isn't normally how we go about these things. You think, oh, how many charts can I get through in half an hour? Or what's as much information as I can fill my audience's head with? But if you start with those emotional objectives, it's a form of framing. It will help you frame what it is that you're trying to say, rather than thinking, first of all, as I say, how much you can cram in, which is never a good way to start. No, and you sometimes find, especially presentations, if you go along that route, you'll find yourself partway through your presentation and then realizing you've still got another half to go and then skipping to all the bits you've missed out on. So I guess, yeah, having that narrative in place, it can help to keep you on track. Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. One is, as I say, I used to be a planner and ad agency, so I used to do many pitches. And over the last few years, I've sort of slightly gone poacher term gamekeeper. So I've worked with a number of clients watching agencies pitch, like the Royal Albert Hall, a couple of years ago. And it's amazing how often 
agencies get that wrong. You say you've got an hour, okay? And I'm not going to name them for very obvious reasons, but it's happened to me in a couple of pitches recently as a client or helping the client where uh, it's got to 45, 50 minutes and the agency said, oh, we've still got the media to do, we've got another 20 minutes. And we said, no, you haven't. We've got 10 minutes. Well, no, we need to do the, you've got 10 minutes. That's it. That's what we agreed. You got, and there's people waiting outside and they will come in at three o'clock. And it's this sort of like sort of complacency and entitlement, which I find very odd. And it's because people don't think about the realities of doing a presentation or a pitch. So one of the rules, and I'll give it to you and your listeners for nothing. One of the rules I give people in presentations is what I call the two thirds rule. So however long you think you've been given to say it's an hour, you only ever write a presentation that's two thirds of that length. So if it's 60 minutes, you write 40. If it's 30 minutes, you write 20. Equally, if it's 15 minutes, you write 10. Why? Because it forces your brain to do the editing. It makes sure that you don't have that disaster that you mentioned, which is you run out of time or someone speaks too long or whatever. So always force yourself to do that. And the second benefit, which I'll come on to talk about, the thing that I go on a lot about in my writing and training is what I call the golden thread, which is the story of Thesis and the Minotaur. If have got time, I'll tell you about that later. Any presentation, any document has to have a thread that runs through it from beginning to end, which holds it together. And again, if you've got that thread, there's less chance that you or a group of people will suddenly go off at random and there's less chance that your audience will literally lose the thread. So again, those are some of the techniques that I, I suggest to people to stop those disasters happening. A lot of people in branding or brand strategy I talk to, brand strategy more than branding, have a background in story or have a love of story or a love of literature. And when I was growing up, my dad used to read me children's versions of, but Greek mythology. So the Odyssey, the Iliad, things like that, but also the myths and the framework of those stories is very interesting because you don't see them as much. Now you do in some context, a lot with some of the newer, potentially even some of the more sci- sci-fi films and things like that. But it's interesting how you mentioned that because I was literally just thinking about bringing that up, the idea of where has that sort of mythology got to and disappeared to that used to be so woven into the fabric of our culture. Yeah, I mean, you just use the word woven into the fabric. So those are storytelling thread. So again, as a classicist, there were the different fates. And they talk about literally yeah. weaving the thread. One of them measures it. One of them cuts it. I'm a big etymology fan. Maybe we can have a three-hour digression here about etymology and, and greenness. I can do that all day. Yeah. I can do that all day. But let me give you one of the obvious ones, which I say to people often. People say to me the thread. I think, well, okay, we have lose the thread. We have, you know, woven through. That language is all part of storytelling. But the most obvious one is when we talk about content. For example, when you get one of these on your phone, the word is text. And it's the same root as text on. We've forgotten Mm. that's what the word text means. Something that is woven through, like textile or texture. So the language of storytelling and myth and the idea of the thread is something that's inherent in stories. The other thing that I don't recommend this all the time for everyone, but there are so many myths, stories, which when I do exercises with clients, we do what I call the heroes and villains exercise. I would encourage people, whether they're classical myths, so whether it's about Sisyphus or Oedipus or whatever it might be, to think about their presentation or think about their brand through the lens of something that is mythological, that is an archetype, as Jung talked about, which means that everyone can understand it. If you just give people fragments of data and numbers, it's very dull, it's very off-putting, it's not very emotive. But if, as I do quite often, you work with global clients, some of those myths and stories are global and everyone can relate to them. And it becomes a really good metaphor or idea that you can hang your data on. Because without something like that, it's easy for it all to sort of disintegrate into just bits of messaging and But if you've got a thread, you've got a story, you've got a metaphor or analogy, that can bind the whole thing together. And that's why I think it's so powerful. Definitely. Yeah, I think the archetype's really interesting to tap into. I I saw it, I think it was a Norwegian agency that had used a folklore tale Mm -hmm. in the advertising and the marketing to make it familiar to that popular culture and kind of they got the messaging because of that folklore and used that on the product, which I found really interesting to tap into that those stories yeah, and, i mean as i say it can be local it can be global you know it can be it doesn't have to be a fully fledged myth i did a thing with a client a few weeks ago i won't mind saying this but the we did an exercise and they came up with the idea of a lighthouse brad as a lighthouse a sort of beacon sort of flashing light and so the whole point is 
whichever type of myth or story you want to land on, obviously it's you know, largely infinite. The point is trying to grasp something or create something which A, everyone can relate to, B, has a sort of emotional pull on people, and C, just leads you away from just having, you know, once, as someone said about history, history is just one damn fact after another. And often our presentation is just one damn chart after another. So anything I can get my sort of clients and people I've worked with to move away from that old sort of way of doing it and get them to create and compose something that's a little bit more, doesn't have to be all the way, the full fat version, whatever you're comfortable with, but just moves them away from that very sort of rational, messaging, didactic way of talking that we've sort of developed. Anything I can do, hopefully, you know, that will help. Yeah, so why do you think storytelling is important for businesses and leaders to get right? What are the main things that it helps with? Let me talk about a couple of, break it up into a couple of different areas, actually. So leaders, brands, and what's important. So magic number three, use magic number three, by the way, Chris, which we know in storytelling. So all incredible loads of three. So Veni, Vidi, Vigi, Liberté, Galate, Fraternité. Three wise men, three blind mice. The number of times you're a lady. So leaders, I think leaders lead through stories. Again, if, whether you look at Alexander Great, Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, whatever, any of the great leaders, Barack Obama, Martin Luther King, Tony Blair, they know the power of a great story and a great anecdote to lead with. So I think that works in its own way. There's a guy called Philip Collins, not the drummer from Genesis, who worked with Tony Blair and he wrote a book called When They Go Low, We Go High, which is a collection of great speeches and why they're so powerful, which again, I recommend anyone to look at. So that's how it works for leadership. For brands, again, it's partly a way of escaping this, we are gonna message our audience into submission. You know, here are our facts, here are our benefits, you know, go out and buy them. It doesn't work, it only addresses what behavioral economists call system two, the very rational, logical part of our brain. And it doesn't engage system one. And it's system one which has all the emotions and where storytelling sort of can really live. So that second reason I talk about sort of storytelling, working from that point of view. And then the broader thing is really just the sort of cultural thing of saying, actually, I just think it's people like stories. People like being in presentations or they like being in conferences where people tell them stories they don't like. And we've all been there going to a conference for five or six hours and all you see is the procession of, of bullet points and numbers and people saying how brilliant they are. So I think for those three reasons, that's how I would come at each of those. And, you know, we can talk for hours just about each of those, but that's a sort of superficial, at least, analysis of how it works there. So what do businesses get wrong with regards to that? What are the things they get wrong so often about storytelling and how they utilise it? I think the main thing they get wrong is just not using it at all, frankly. The second thing, which actually, to be more specific, I hear this a lot from clients who send me an email or message on LinkedIn saying, you know, we have some stories, but we want to make them a bit better. And I'll say, okay, let's look at your website, show me your stories. And I'll go, uh, they're not stories? And they'll say, yes, they are. And I said, no, they're not, they're case studies. And they'll say, what do you mean? I said, just because you say they're stories doesn't mean they're stories. They're case studies where basically the same formula, you know, somebody asked us to do X, we did X, huzzah not a story you know it's just we were brilliant so clients often mistake story for just you know this happened and then this happened so it's understanding again things like heroes and villains it's understanding you can't have a story without conflict it's understanding that you have to have some sort of up and down some sort of tension and resolution and as i've said already understanding you have to have emotions in there and all of those things are features which clients think they are doing but more often than not they're not so in terms of the idea of tension and some of the points you came across there how would you approach that with a client when you're talking to that individual client what are the steps you kind of take them through and is that what's in your the storytelling workbook is that kind of the process you use yeah it is in the first book storytelling book it's in the follow-up storytelling workbook and the other books are also stories of how we can incite people to think differently so insight how we can get use famous sayings, expressions, slogans. But the main thing I do, and obviously it's a case-by-case -case basis, so that's the first thing to say, but is to get people away from this very reductive, arid, dry way of talking about brands, which is, you know, we make X and it's brilliant, or we do this and people, you know. It's a very, very sort of, again, when I grew up in advertising as a baby planner, we used to call them transportation models. But the idea that you transport the consumer or the stakeholder 
from one stage to the next. So anyone listening might remember things like AIDA, that you had to have awareness, then interest, yes. then desire, then action. That's nonsense. I can honestly say that without it being too, you know, categorical. <laughs> because behavioral economics just says, firstly, it's about desire. So desire doesn't come third, it often comes first. Secondly, you don't always have to create awareness because often we're not even aware of these things. And equally, sometimes action can be the very first thing that you aim for. So this idea that everything has to happen step by step and logically is often where clients go wrong. So part of it is me getting them to say, okay, so what are we trying to do? Is it desire? Is it action? If it is, what sort of emotions are we trying to engender you know, for the brand or for the piece of communication? And then we'll bring in other storytelling tricks and tips like headlining. Again, anyone who's ever worked in advertising, we know the power of a good headline. So whether it's a brand strategy or a website or a presentation, you know, a headline which is surprising and short and provocative, six to 10 words, is a really great discipline. How can you, if you call it the elevator pitch, whatever, how can you condense everything you're saying into something that is short and precise and emotionally provocative? So all those sorts of things are in the toolbox, if you like. But it's a matter of, again, where the client's coming from, what their market is, who their audience is, et cetera, et cetera. But there's an awful lot of things that are in both of the books and in the training, which we can throw and use with clients to get them to do things better. So I'd like to come back to the idea of the metaphors and things you talked about in the book of inciting a different way of thinking. I think that'd be really interesting to touch on. But just before that, when you're creating a narrative or a story for a brand, do you think about it across different channels, different mediums, different aspects, telling an interwoven story, using a woven analogy again, but interwoven story across those different channels. Is that how you would approach it and have different parts for the different things like action and, and desire and things like that? I think perhaps because I come from a planning strategy background, I'm always channel neutral. I think that media, I wouldn't say it's the last piece in the jigsaw, but I never think about media first. I always think about the idea. I just think ideas, both in any form of storytelling, any form of writing, any form of communication, it's ideas that matter. So for me, I always think about, okay, how does this idea how it work? How does the narrative work? And then what's the best way of using that medium by medium? So I've got a couple of clients, one I probably won't mention specifically, and they know that they've done some stuff in mainstream media, which works, and it has a different tone of voice, for example, on Instagram or TikTok, because it's just the nature of that media. But the story is still the same the brand values, the personality remains consistent. So for me, that's always at the core of things. It's coherent and consistent about the story or about the brand. And then once you've got that, you're allowed to sort of play with it, as I say, in different media. And again, some clients I work with and some I observe do that very well, some do it very badly. And before you ask me, don't tell me to say, ask me to say who does it very bad. I'll get into trouble. But for me, that's, again, sometimes that where people think, okay, it's a different medium, so we'll go off in a complete... No, you need to keep true to the values and true to the story and then just adapt it medium by medium. But it's really about, as I say, understanding the personality, the story, the type of characters that you're trying to create. So when you talk about archetypes and working that into the idea of the story, what's your approach to archetypes and how you use them in regard to the story? I don't go the sort of full fat version of archetypes because generally, if I'm doing training or whatever, I have either haven't got time if it's a day. And also, I don't think it always works for every audience. So I tend to rely on three, heroes, villains, and mentors. So what I try and say with clients is, okay, and this is anyone who's been on my training or read the books, you'll see what I mean. I try and say, okay, in any story, you need to have a conflict. So the hero and the villain can be people, but they can often be ideas. And I think often I say to people in documents and presentations and speeches, often ideas are protagonists. So whether you're creating people as characters or ideas as characters, you need to create that tension and conflict. Because once you have a conflict, the brain is involved. The brain likes heroes, villains, good and bad, up and down, because it forces the brain to take a side. So I, I spend a lot of time working with them on that. And then the mentor comes in because it's the mentor historically in storytelling theory isn't the hero, but they help the hero achieve their quest. They are the repository of calmness, knowledge, wisdom, reassurance. So often the brand or the client might be the mentor. And sometimes I find clients who always want to be the hero. <laughs> and I'm saying, not always. Well, not always. In fact, often it's better if you're not the hero, but you allow 
the hero to achieve their goal, to achieve whatever it is their challenge. And within that sort of creative framework, and again, most of the clients who come on this know by definition, because it's about storytelling, they know that they're going to be on a creative journey. Occasionally, people find it a bit too creative, and I understand that. But over the years, even with working with like data squirrels, most of them are happy to try and play with it, because it is very playful and creative. And as I said, I've done it across different countries and different markets and all sorts of public sector, private sector. And, you know, 99% of people run with it. And even if they don't use it, ultimately, it's quite a liberating experience just to move away from, you know, here's a series of 50 slides I'm going to put you through. So in terms of the book, what was the why behind the book? What was the why behind, well, all of your books, but, but the new one especially? The new one was the first one came out, I can't believe, in 2015. And again, magic number three, three parts. So firstly, where we've gone wrong, why we've just lost the art of storytelling. And I coined this expression drip. We're living in a drip world, data rich, insight poor. So part of it was a rant to say insight is important, particularly in the world that I sort of work in. Um, how can we bring storytelling to make insight more powerful and better communicated? The middle part was why we've lost the art of storytelling, and the rest of the book was some tips and tricks. And partly because I've just been doing more training over the years. I did the second book which was the Inspiratorium, which was about creating a culture of insight and understanding how insight actually works rather than how many research people think it works. And the third one was a collection of, say, a collection of sayings and expressions and slogans, again, to sort of make you think differently. My publisher said, actually, you know, the storytelling thing is quite interesting, quite powerful. Is there more in it? And I said, yep, there's plenty more in it. So what we wanted to do was, A, make it more of a workbook. So there's lots of exercises that you go through in the book. So there's a section of, okay, this is what I'm talking about, and then now you put it into practice. But the other thing we wanted to do was we've looked at specific audiences. So as well as talking to people who do presentations, people who work in branding and comms, we had a couple of other specific audiences. So one was anyone who has to write a CV or anyone who wants to describe themselves more distinctively or more imaginatively on LinkedIn. Because trust me, I've watched a lot of people on LinkedIn and a lot of the things they say, A, are identical and B, they're incredibly dull. So part of it, again, is how can you tell your own story to make yourself sound more interesting, more saleable, etc. on LinkedIn? And one other area which I thought was quite funny because my kids are in their 20s now, was if you're interested in dating apps. Specifically, if you're going on a dating app and again, you want to sound, make yourself sound different. So for all these exercises, they're the box that says, you know, I want to apply to presentations, I want to apply to my brand, I want to apply it to LinkedIn profile, or I want to help my uh, Tinder profile look better. So again, we wanted to sort of get people to sort of think about how they can put it into practice in their own particular ways. So that's the main reason for it, plus the fact that I just can't stop writing about storytelling. Cool. So in, in terms of that, then, you said about changing the mindset, about inspiring people, and then to get into the insight mindset rather than the data drip that you mentioned. Yeah. What are some things that people can do to help themselves become more insightful, become more creative and open their mind up to that way of thinking? It's almost as if you've given me the chance to plug my next book. Oh, brilliant. Which is going to be called The Insight Book. Oh, brilliant. Which two hours ago, I just talked to the designer about. I want to make the cover really shocking orange or shocking pink because that's how I think insight should feel. It should feel shocking and bright and exciting. So this, this book, the new book, is equally gold because of the golden thread. But I want to talk about insight because data people often use the word insight and the research industry will often talk about we, we are good at insights. And I hate to disagree, but you're not. Having lots of numbers or having lots of facts or observations is not an insight. And I talk about the difference between what an insight is and what it feels like. And I'm more interested, I think, in how an insight feels. So there's a quote by Isaac Asimov. As a teenage boy, like many teenage boys, I read science fiction. So if any of you are listening has read Foundation and Empire or iRobots, or seen the film iRobot, Isaac Asimov was a famous science fiction writer and scientist. And I loved what he said. He was asked about eureka moments, because scientists talk about eureka moments. I found it, Archimedes, another classical story. But Isaac Asimov said this, he said, when, when scientists find something amazing, they don't go eureka. They go, that's funny. And that's what an insight is for me. It makes you go, hmm, that's funny. And 90% of the stuff that I get shown 
by clients or research teams or baby planners. And they, this is an insight. No, it isn't. No, it's not an insight because it's not making me feel surprised. It's not provoking an emotional response. It's not making me think about something different. And I have a quote, which again is in the book, the new book, uh, which is information is to be collected, but insight is to be connected. So insight is when our brain connects different things. So any creative person, I talk about, is it Stuart Kaufman? No, not Stuart Kaufman. I'll, I'll come back to what his name was. The guy who wrote being John Malkovich. He talks about, he had these ideas in his head. So one idea was a couple of people who work together, who have a fight, have an argument. And another idea was having a portal into someone's head. And he couldn't make these things work. And he just put them together and it became being John Malkovich. Uh, Suzanne Collins talks about, she was skipping through the news channels. And one day she saw reality TV programs, game shows, panel shows, and then she saw some war footage and just put them together. So insight is often about juxtaposing things that our brain doesn't necessarily think about putting together. When you put them together, you get that aha of things creating something new that weren't there in their separate parts. So all this for me is fascinating about what insight is. But it's often not what people in data and research understand as insight. Yeah, that's really interesting and insightful, I will say, because it's kind of one of my dad's favorite authors was Asimov. So I grew up with the foundation books and things like that. Yeah. Love those stories. And actually, when you think about it, is that there's a documentary of something called Everything's a Remix or It's All a Remix. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's great with regards to even the idea of obviously Star Wars with the idea of the samurai and the Wild West coming together in one thing. And as they merge together, you get that connection. But that fascinates me, the idea that insight is about making those connections, because I definitely find when you work on any sort of client for a strategy project, it's when you have those moments, those aha moments, that you suddenly get it and you feel it and you think you're onto something. And it's almost like you said, it's that bright flash of imagination that just comes out. So really exciting. It is. And I think I was often asked this, and I actually use a lot of examples in, in a new book, the next one coming out next year. So, you know, to the Guardian, the point of view ad, you talk about Marmite, you talk about Channel 4. And those are genuine insights which make you see those brands differently. Or Dove, Campaign for Real Beauty, or Purcell, Dirt is Good. Because you look at those and you go, yeah, that's different. They've done something. And part of the reason I've written this, the new book, is a sort of, it's not exactly a hit job, but I'm just worried about an awful lot of market research with an analysts who've devalued the term insight. Insights are really hard to come up with. And there's been this sort of currency now that clients expect planners or agencies or brand strategies to deliver, you know, like three insights before breakfast. It doesn't happen that way. So it's partly to say to clients, you've got to understand how insights actually happen. So don't expect too much too quickly because it, it won't happen. But it's more importantly, I think, a sort of a manifesto for people to say, okay, you're not going to get insights if all you do is just sit and stare forever at data from your own market. You have to allow your brain to wander, to go off into different places and to allow these sort of connections, unexpected collisions, if you like, to happen. It's often called combinatorial play by people like Steven Pinker. And it's only when your brain does that that you're likely to sort of fall upon an insight. If all you ever do, as I say, is to study one market all the time and look at data from that market all the time, it's highly unlikely you'll come up with anything that I would call insight. Oh, I like that idea of actually, yeah, almost treating it like a muscle with that play you mentioned and kind of actually utilizing that more. There was something I heard from a guy who worked at Google who was a data analyst and he's one of the top ones and he actually said it's more about a conversation than it is about these data points. It's more about learning, he used the word story, understanding the story of the customers and using the numbers to back that up as opposed to the other way around, which is what I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I think I might have seen that one as well. But no, again, going back to the sort of golden thread, what I recommend to people, which again is sort of turning upside down, and not exactly counterintuitive, but I'll say, okay, you've got all your data. The way the brain works is it's all spilling around. You've got all your hypotheses and whatever. Set that aside and allow your brain to generate different threads. Now, you need to keep always keep a balance here between obviously being true to the data, but allow your brain to generate one, two, three, five threads and then just see what thread seems to be, A, truest to the data, because nothing will ever be 100%. Secondly, which one feels like it's got the most sort of emotional heft to it? And thirdly, what's the one that will actually work on your audience the best? So again, magic number three. 
Now, within those three, obviously there's checks and balances. You, you can't throw all of it into one hypothesis if you know the data doesn't support that. But I would say, okay, now start with that. Start developing those hypotheses, storyboard them, which is what creative people do. Write them out, no data, just write the story out and then put the data in. And then once you look at these storyboards and look at these threads, some of them you'll say, no, actually that doesn't work. It's not true to the data. It's not really what the client, whatever. But somewhere within that, one of them will probably stand out. And as long as you're happy with that, that's the one that I recommend you go with. But it's going through that process first, which is not what most people do, that I recommend is the sort of the best way of, of making storytelling work in that sense. So in terms of the workbook itself, are there other lessons in there that you've got that you could share with us, a few other lessons that you could tap into that we could uh, talk about? Yeah, I mean, one of the first things that I talk about is I have another expression which I use called attention spam with an M. Again, talk about insight, insight serendipity. I it was just a typo a few years ago. I was writing attention spam. And if anyone now listening looks at your computer, you'll see that N and M are next to each other on the keyboard. And I just typed attention spam. And I thought, oh, I quite like that. So that's become my sort of first go-to, which is that your main goal in any piece of communication, brand communication, website, speech, PowerPoint, how do you get through your audience's attention span? Because most of what goes into our brain, we like to think it goes into our attention inbox, but it go, most of it, 90% of it, no one really knows, neuroscience disagrees, but most of it goes into what I now call the attention span because it's not interesting, it's not emotional, it's not. So your first task is understanding how you get through that. And that's where most presentations from clients that I see or speeches or my students, that's where they fail because they don't even get through attention span. So that's the first thing that I sort of talk about. The other thing I'm, I'm a big fan of, which is a, an exercise in the book, is what I call grab them early, which again is not going to be a surprise to anyone listening. But think about the first thing that people see in your presentation or the homepage on your website, or the first thing you get up and say in a speech. Most of the time, it's going to be dull. Most of the time, people stand up or introduce a meeting and say, okay, this is what we've done. This is the background or hello. And start with something that is going to get people's attention. Go back to attention span. If you want to get people emotionally involved, start with a story, start with your metaphor, start with something that's provocative, and then work your way back to explain to your audience how you got there. If you like, start at the end. There's an, a whole section, again, in the book about why endings are important. Because again, often we finish a presentation or a speech with something very dull, like thank you or any questions. But Daniel Kahneman talks about the peak end effect. Our memories, both good and bad, are filtered through two criteria. How do they feel at their peak? Did we have a fantastic holiday moment where we saw the Sydney Opera House? Or a terrible peak where, you know, the hotel was terrible? But then we think about how we felt at the end. And it works again for stories, films, you know, if you like Mad Men, which I did, the ending was brilliant, Breaking Bad, the ending was brilliant, Lost, nah, not so good. And don't talk to me about the game, ending of Game of Thrones. Yeah. Endings do matter. But the point is, if you start well and you end well and you have a thread, that's an awful lot of what storytelling is about. And as I say, most of the stuff I see fails because it doesn't follow any of those three principles. Game of Thrones is an interesting one, so we bring it up because it kind of it's very interesting because we used to repeatedly watch that over and over until that last season. And then now there's no feeling now to go back over it. Because the ending was so not what we thought it was going to be, there's no need to you don't want to go back and revisit it. It's almost like it's kind of it's ruined that experience, that journey. It has, and people feel like almost embarrassed to talk about that last series. Because, you know, anyone who's interested, George R. R. Martin didn't write it, the directors and writers of the series wrote it, and it wasn't the ending that, you know, originally I think they produced, but it was just all over the place. And again, I love Lost. Uh, I've just read a book called The Anomaly, which has, again, got a fantastic story and has a clever ending. But it is important because too often endings matter. What Kahneman said is, it didn't matter whether you had a holiday for a day, a week, or a month. The duration wasn't important. What mattered was having a peak and how people felt at the end. And again, it's just not something that we think about normally in terms of how stories work and how communications work. And it is something that is absolutely practically relevant to everything that we produce and everything that we create. So those are some things which hopefully people can just put into practice immediately. Definitely, yeah, thank you. I really like attention spam. I think that's brilliant. And it's got that metaphor to it and when you said about the inbox going in the inbox or in the spam it's really easy to remember 
And I think that comes with really great messaging, but also messaging that makes you stop and think and is different. There's a memory aspect to it, whereas some other things just don't ever get that. So is, is memory tied to those moments of insight? Is that memory creating as well at that point? A word you just used, which I always use pejoratively because I don't like it, is messaging. Yep. I don't like the word messaging because messaging always sounds like it's one person at another or one brand at people. Yeah. So I often can contrast messaging, which is I've got a message and you're going to take it, with massaging, which is about understanding how people feel about themselves or about their sense of who they are or how they want to be portrayed to other people. And I think more communication should be about massaging. I don't mean massaging the data, that's not what I mean, but I mean making people feel good about what it is that you're saying. Because again, behavioral economics tells us if you tell people just what to do, most of the time we ignore it. Any of your listeners who've got children, you know, tell them what happens when you tell them what to do. Yeah. So massaging is about understanding again the feelings. So what is it you're trying to get people to feel? And too much communication is messaging. It's very didactic. It's very finger pointy. And again, this is what governments have learned from behavioral economics. If you point the finger at people, people get defensive and they feel like they're being treated like they're idiots. So again, the morals of behavioral economics is make your communication more rewarding, more satisfying. So I think all those things play into what, you know, what I've been talking about as well. Definitely, yeah. So what makes you mad about your industry? I think the communications industry, what makes me mad, I think it's learned very little over about 100 years. A number of people have written books about the history of advertising. If you look at Claude Hopkins or Rosa Reeves, but then you look at people like David Ogilvy or one of my great heroes, Bill Burnback at DDB, who created Avis, We Try Harder. He created the Lemon campaign for Volkswagen. That is the 60s. What have we really learned in 60 years? Behavioral economics only really, Kahneman and Tversky started in the late 70s. It only really came out into my world in the you know, 2000s. I think we've learned really, really little in that sort of intervening period. And it does make me mad that so even now, so many clients I know still feel that behavioral economics is a bit soft and pink and fluffy and it's not for them. So that does make me mad. And what other also makes me mad is the lack of theory, which is sort of linked to what I've just said. So I lecture at Bucks on their advertising course, I lecture at Nottingham Trent on one of their marketing courses. And a lot of people who come into the communications world don't have theory. They just have a sense of, you know, Instagram. The the answer is always social media. What's the question? It doesn't matter. The answer is social media. And there's so much theory out there about how communications works and how human beings work, behavioral economics. And yet a lot of people come into marketing, sales, PR, HR, whatever, HR, and don't have any sense of theory. So that really makes me a bit mad. Yeah. Yeah, I can agree with that one. Definitely. So in terms of the theory side of things, what are some things that people can pick up on? that would be good to set them on the right path? I think they should definitely learn from some of the greats. I think people in marketing, often what happens in business is, and it happens a lot when I used to work on Peugeot or Cadbury, big agencies, clients would move their people around, which in some ways was a good thing to get them exposed to product, sales, marketing, whatever. But what I found, which was really, again, I'm not always mad, by the way, but what would annoy me was that people would come in suddenly to marketing who'd never done a day of training or thinking about marketing or advertising. I had a client, I always say, again, for obvious reasons, who used to work in the parts department, who suddenly turned up as head of research as my opposite number, and had never seen, had never done a day's training, had never had any understanding of how advertising might work or how you even tested advertising, and suddenly was in charge of a two million pound research budget for advertising. And I used to say, well, if you unfortunately have a problem with your brain and you go to a neuroscientist or a neurologist you don't want to go in to surgery and they say well i was actually in uh, pediatrics last week but i'm going to try with your brain is that all right you want somebody who's been around a bit who knows what they're doing but for some reason that doesn't apply in marketing and advertising i think it's because we all we're surrounded by marketing and advertising everyone thinks they're an expert you know you watch television you see ads you go drive around you see posters everyone thinks they're an expert but they're not. There are theories about how these things work. So I think it would be really good if people who come into the business, whatever it is, branding, strategy, comms, PR, whatever, get some sort of introduction to the theories about how communications work and behavioral economics, about how human beings work and how we influence human behavior. Also, by the way, when I'm on a rant, I think schools, 
And I think we should teach kids at school, probably in secondary school, about how communications work and how people are trying to influence them, whether it's advertisers or politicians. I really think it would be a really good thing to put on the curriculum. I know I've got friends who are teachers who don't want anything added to the curriculum. Understand that. But, you know, I can be utopian. Yeah, and I, my wife used to be a, used to be a teacher. And uh, so, yeah, I totally agree with you with regards to having more creativity on the curriculum would be a great thing in all forms. Yeah. But, yeah, definitely. I think it's interesting. There's, there's been a few projects I've worked on where someone's come in halfway through process and has started and like you said everyone thinks they have a, an opinion on it on marketing or branding and it's quite a tricky one to get around because you wouldn't do it in other industries it's quite strange why it happens in that industry and like you said it's probably because we're constantly bombarded by it people everyone thinks they have a view on it but it is an interesting thing that we have to go through in our space that that happens but yeah so in terms of you were talking earlier on about the idea of the thread the golden thread yeah. what are some things that people can do to embed that into their stories, how can they utilize that? You mentioned the storyboarding, but there are other ways that can be used. Yeah, I think the main thing I would say is start off by thinking about your thread as soon as you can. And the thread can be a hypothesis, it can be a what if, it can be an idea, but think about what that thread might be that you are happy to run through the presentation. One of the most important things I don't think I've talked about yet, about storytelling, storyboarding, having a golden thread is editing. So one of the things I talk a lot about is signal and noise. I don't know how I've managed to go half an hour off without mentioning it. So a lot of what you're doing with the golden thread is establishing how you elevate your signal by eliminating the noise. And again, 90% of the clients I work with, the speeches I see or the documents, I have to say that. I have to say, this is all noise. What's your signal? What's the thing you really want people to take out? Is it a fact? Is it an emotion? Is it work out ways in which you can elevate that signal by reducing the noise. And that is editing, as any journalist, anyone who's done journalism will tell you. Half of, I think Hemingway said, all writing is rewriting. So a lot of the golden thread is that writing, rewriting, and rewriting, and rewriting. There's a quote I use in training and in a book by E.M. Forster, and it's a quite a philosophical quote, so just sit down and think about this for a minute while everyone's listening. He said, how do I know what I think till I see what I say? In other words, you have to start writing your stuff because as you start writing, your brain goes, oh, okay, that's clear. I didn't. So there's an awful lot where your brain writes stuff. And then as you write, it becomes thinner and more concise. And as it becomes more concise and more clear, a thread emerges. But you have to throw out a lot of chaff to get to that. So that is something that I can talk about now in theory, but it's something that I work with an awful lot with clients, literally sort of one-to-one -one on that because you have to do that. But it's something you can learn to do. But it's tearing yourself away from this obsession with quantity, an obsession with facts, an obsession with sort of hundreds of bullet points. So that's probably just about the most important thing I would suggest for that. I was going to mention earlier on, and I was thinking about it when you said attention spam, and it tapped into something where I was thinking about comedy. So the way that comedy is unpredictable, and the way that it goes down a route and then changes, and also similar with magicians and magic tricks and illusions, it's all about predictability. You think the ball is going to be somewhere and then it isn't where it, you think it's going to be. And is that kind of like the best stories? They taking you on that journey to unpredictability. Is that the route that helps with stories? Again, you've referred to stuff in book two and a lot of stuff that's in the new book. So two of my other interests, I'm not a magician. My middle son was a member of the Magic Circle. But there's a thing that Penn and Teller, I'm huge fans, and Teller says this thing, he says, it's the shock. The thing about magic, it's the shock that you get, the shiver of expectation. And again, for me, there's an awful lot of overlap between comedy, magic, and insight. So I've written a lot about, I love comedy. I've even written some stuff myself, but I love comedy. And the comedy analogy, I think, is perfect. So two fish in a tank, one says to the other, how do you drive this thing? And hopefully, if you get that, what you're getting and you use the word, you're getting a recalibration. So you get the narrative, but then you get something that surprises you and shocks you, and you then go back and realize, ah, actually the tank is not that tank, it's a different tank. By the way, there's a quote I use in the book by an American humorist, who says you should never analyze humor. It says analyzing humor is di like dissecting a frog. No one's interested and the frog dies. So I'm aware of that with comedy, but it is an absolute, I think an absolute perfect in that well, you know, any analogy is perfect between insight and humor because they are exactly the same sorts of shock. And you didn't use the word chart, Chris, but I'm going to give you the word. It's called paraprosdokian. 
which means against what you expect. So again, insight and humor, a punchline takes you in a direction, but then it, you swerve off. And that's what makes humor and comedy so memorable. And it's also, as I say, a way I think of metaphorically thinking about insight. So all those things for me, humor, insight, stories, they're all, and emotions, they're all playing in the same sort of game, all playing this in the same sort of field. That's why I'm interested in how they all sort of interlink. Yeah, and I was thinking as well, the tie-in with um, symbolism and the idea of symbolism. And, you know, we think of those characters in the stories and mythology, how the symbols that they represent almost to us, how they tell a story in themselves. And I quite like one of the things I like about branding is it kind of connects with those things, you know, even just the logo, but obviously a brand is much more than that. But the symbols that they create is the thing. Is there a connection between that so the symbolism side of things, which obviously metaphor and analogy into those stories and how you then develop them? Yeah, and we haven't had enough etymology on this, have we, really? So I think I talk about it in one of the books. It might be a new one. Again, as a classicist story for throwing us everyone, the Greek word symbolon, from which we get symbol, means to throw together. So the last part of that word is the same word as ballet or ballistics, which means throwing. So a symbol is, is things that are thrown together. So it has one meaning, but it has another meaning. And again, that's what our brains like doing. That's what stories are about, creating links and connections and symbols. So I'm a big fan of, you know, these classicists writing new books like Natalie Haynes, the last book, Pandora's Jar, or some box, it was a jar. So the thing about Pandora's Jar, she wasn't meant to open it. All the evils were let out except the last one, which was hope. So all these myths and all these stories are symbolic. And as Jung said in Archetypes, what they do is they tell us about ourselves. So I talk about in one of the books, I think it's spiritual one, about Oedipus. So probably most people listening will know a bit about Oedipus, which I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not the first person to say this, I think is the world's first detective story. And spoiler alert, he did it. But that's what's brilliant about that, because it's about the symbolism of knowledge. You know, when is knowing too much a bad thing? Should, should Oedipus have just shut up and you know, not looked into everything that happened? So all of these things are linked, symbols and stories and meaning. And again, meaning is one of the things I talk an awful lot about, rather than message or truth. Clients are obsessed with message and truth and benefits. I prefer to use things like meaning. All human beings need meaning. Another word I'll give you, carnivores eat meats, herbivores eat vegetables or grass. I use the word semivore. Human beings consume meaning, like semantics or semiotics. So any person, whether they're a consumer or a stakeholder, we need meaning in our lives. And again, that's what storytelling does. Storytelling gives us meaning. So, you know, brands and symbols and meanings, emotions, again, they're all, for me, all tied up. And that's what I think branding and communications, that's why I think it's so satisfying and so creative. Definitely. And when you say meaning, I man's search for meaning, the kind of, you know, when everything's stripped back, the thing that you're looking for is that meaning. And I guess that is the thing that is the constant with most people is looking for that meaning, constantly searching for it. So in terms of, from your point of view, it can be a client or it can be a company you've seen recently who are really nailing it when it comes to storytelling in the right way. I think some of the obvious examples, I mean, I think Apple has always got it. And I think it was largely to do with Steve Jobs. But the sense that, yes, they're in computing. Yes, they're in technology. Yes, they're competing with Microsoft. But they just created their own personality, their own voice, calling them genius bars, having the... You talked about logos before, having the Apple logo with a bite taken out. All of those things, I think, they use really well. I think they've lost a little bit of that luster over the last few years. At the other end of the spectrum, and I declare interest here, um, I did some work a few years ago with Specsavers. I used to go to Guernsey. I knew the creative director very well, Graham. And I think they did it brilliantly. Because I often ask people, and again, I'll ask you, Chris, and your audience, are your eyes important to you? Interesting, yeah. So vision is serious, yeah? It's yep. a serious matter. So how come Specsavers make a joke of it? And have they done so successfully? And the answer I give is empathy. What they've said is, yes, it's serious. Yes, it's important. But they haven't made it dull and, and factual. They made it about humour and empathy. And they've, again, moved away from it because they've had new marketing directors and things. But when they created Should Have Gone to Specsavers, it's one of the most, I think, most powerful symbolic campaigns because it's just about understanding that very simple truth if you can't see things properly. And interestingly, one of their competitors tried to sort of attack them and say, we take vision seriously. It didn't work because they'd owned that whole territory of empathy and emotion and, and humor. So I think in the way that I would describe storytelling, I think they've done it absolutely brilliantly. And as we said before, across different media, 
you know, different channels, different ways of talking about the brand, especially on, you know, on TV, but equally on Twitter. Um, they've got that sort of tone of voice and personality spot on. I saw a Spet Savers campaign, you talking, it's reminded me of it. it was an outdoor campaign and it was a billboard and it had a ladder papered over and the ladder was up against the billboard thing and it just said should have gone spec savers and that was it but you see it first of all you see the ladder and the paper going over it and you think oh what's happened there and then when you hit the punchline or the slogan of that thing it just instantly clicks i think what they've done was also the pieces were out of order weren't they it was like that bit on the left was in the middle whatever and as you say use the word punchline which we talked about a slogan or a punchline is that oh i see what you've done there yeah it's again emotionally rewarding and one of the things as one of my own theories of communication is there should be some emotional reward. And if all your communication is just telling people facts, um, and again, I'll, I'll give you another quote from Andrew Stanton. So again, I'm a big film fan. I used to be a trustee of the Phoenix Cinema in North London, always continued running cinema in the UK. And Andrew Stanton was the guy, one of the guys at Pixar, behind Wally -E and Up and Toy Story stories and etc. Just fantastic, you know, one extraordinary range of films he's co-written or produced or directed. And there's a speech that he gives on TED, TED speech that he gives on YouTube. And I need to say this now, by the way, it starts off with the world's filthiest joke, so just please be careful if you do listen to it. But in the speech, he talks about, in a story, you give people two plus two, but you don't give them four. And I've always loved that as a thought, because most communication, most advertising is four. Here it is, here's the answer, off you go. Giving two plus two allows the brain to complete four. So the brain participates, the brain is part of the communication. So again, that's why I think humour works, because your brain sort of decodes the punchline, and you go, oh, I see, that's clever, that's what you've done there. And I think, I'm not saying all communication should be like that, but I think if you've got something that has that ability for your audience to fill in the answer, if you like, I think you're more likely to get the emotional rewards that the story can bring. Yeah, that's really interesting. I like that. So you could even do that with bringing things together that were unexpected, but from different areas, different messages, not messages, like you said, massages from earlier on, but bringing those things together across different mediums to build up that story of the brand. I like that. Yeah, I talk a lot about in all the books, because it's one of the big emotions about surprise and how surprise has an evolutionary role to make sure that we don't exit the gene pool. And yet so little communication is surprising. So much of it is banal, banal and bland and conformist, and vanilla so a lot of what i do the word surprise comes up you know every 30 seconds and again i think brands that have done that well you know i think again tesco every little helps when it came out was very on the nose and it's still very powerful and i think good brands that do that you know meerkat again another one they break the rules you know it's not again it's not a new thing to say but finding out what are the rules and the conventions of a sector or of a market or of a brand or of a, a medium, and then finding out which ones you can legitimately break is always a great way of coming up with new creative ideas. Thank you. It's been absolutely awesome having you on. It's been a great talk and I could do it all day. I really appreciate it. And uh, where could people find out a little bit more about yourself, your books, and just, yeah, get in touch if they need to. Um, I'm Taz Tazgal, I think on LinkedIn. A clue to where I live on Twitter is Taswell Hill where I live in North London. Um, if you just look at Amazon, if you look at T-A-S-G-A-L, you'll find some of the books, all the books, hopefully on Amazon. And the new book is certainly in uh, some Smiths, Waterstones and Foils with a bit of luck. Yeah, that's pretty much where, where I can be located. Brilliant. I'll put all those links in the show notes. And also, when is the next book coming up? Edit's gone in now, hopefully sort of December, January, probably, or maybe January, February. So still plenty of time to buy the storytelling workbook at the moment, but then the Insight book, hopefully, yeah, early next year. Wow, that sounds, yeah, it sounds brilliant. It sounds really interesting. So I'll definitely be on a purchasing list for that one. So um, yeah, thanks very much for coming on and uh, I'd love to do it again sometime. It was awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Speak to you soon. We just put together a weekly brand tip video series, which is designed to help you to unlock your brand's potential and stand out from the competition. And if you're interested, if you just go to elementsbrandmanagement, or one word, .co.uk forward slash weekly hyphen brand hyphen tips sign up and you'll be delivered a three to five minute video a week straight to your inbox i'll put a link in the show notes if you're interested if you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to receive more you can subscribe in all the usual places we're talking itunes spotify stitcher please if you get a chance rate and review it helps a podcast to kind of get a bit more visibility and allows us to keep on producing these podcasts have a great week catch up soon keep those brands unified